So welcome everyone to this special session on meta literacy and digital citizenship here in Second Life, which I like to call the original metaverse. And as John said, I'm Dr. Valerie Hill. I've been researching virtual environments for about 16 years, and my avatar name, Val Librarian, shows my purpose here in virtual worlds and my research, my focus, which is on changing literacy. As the information revolution turned literacy and our lives upside down. I am the director of the Community Virtual Library right here in Second Life, which is a real library in a virtual world, overseen by real librarians and information professionals. I also work to support the Virtual Worlds Education Consortium here in Second Life. So let me begin by saying that libraries and literacy have changed during my lifetime greatly, and those changes impact each one of us. Changing literacy impacts us all, and you're going to hear me talk about meta-literacy, which is a new way to perceive literacy. So I'm going to ask you to follow me, and let's walk over to my presentation. So step over out of the ring and follow me over to my slides. Walk this way, please. Place your camera on me as I will be the pointer for my slides. You'll, me, you'll see me sit up here on my presentation as we go along. You can see I'm sitting on top of the, uh, the slide Meta Literacy for Digital Citizens. And that's, a, that's the cover of my book. The title is Meta Modernism and Changing Literacy. So there is now a need for a new look at literacy, meta-literacy. The meta-literacy is a new term for literacy in digital culture because we can communicate with many digital tools all over the world simultaneously. Literacy used to mean reading and writing primarily in print, but today most content is born digital. Literacy in digital culture requires juggling formats, both physical and digital. And we are all now required to become good digital citizens, as most of our communication and our information intake is in digital formats. So here we are, interacting as avatars. Which means we are a digital embodiment of ourselves, each one of us. So please type a Y in the local chat, the text chat here, if you feel that digital citizenship is important. Or type an N if you're unfamiliar with that term, if you've never heard the term digital citizen. Right, I'm seeing some Ys. Digital citizenship very similar to what digital citizenship was, what physical world citizenship was, uh, when we primarily worked, lived, or learning in physical environments. But now we do a lot of our work digitally. So if you haven't become familiar with it, I hope you'll be more familiar with what it means to be a digital citizen after this presentation. So I'm gonna move over to my next slide. So Alvin Toffler, he's a well-known futurist, and he coined the term prosumer when he began to see that individuals were beginning to create and share content themselves, what we like to call in digital culture, user-generated content that we upload online. The information hierarchy toppled during my career as a librarian. We have far more user-generated content than we do traditional media formats, such as books. So my library completely turned upside down. 
YouTube has probably become the number one source of information on the planet. And TikTok has become currently the number one social media platform globally. Where people are constantly uploading their own content. We are both consumers and producers of media. And if you put those two words together, you get the word prosumer. Yes, we are prosumers. And with all this user-generated content being uploaded every single moment of the day, we are bombarded by information constantly. This is a challenge to literacy. The sheer volume of information that we get every single day. And this illustrates the need to rethink about literacy. So think for a minute, how many of you upload content online? Now, if you do, please type the platform where you upload or post content the most often, such as Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, a blog, Twitter, Twitch, Discord, TikTok, or any other app or site where you're uploading your own content. And I see, I think, is it Bianca? Instagram, yes, Snapchat, TikTok, Pinterest. Yes, there are many, many sites where you can follow others who upload their content and upload content yourself as a prosumer. I'll move over to another slide where you'll see Alvin Toffler's picture. Alvin Toffler has a famous quote, which I love. This quote relates to changing literacy, which has been my profession for many years. Alvin Toffler says, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Now, he wrote this back in the 80s. So he was a futurist who saw what was coming, that we no longer just read and write. We have apps, 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 and they're constantly changing. We have to unlearn them, get the latest upgrade, and relearn them. Now that's meta-literacy. That's changing literacy. Our apps and operating systems, they're constantly updating, upgrading, and changing. I work with some elderly people often, and I find this is a constant challenge for them because... In the past, they learned in a more linear way. This constant oscillation, this swinging between production and consumption of media, and a swinging between physical and digital formats, aligns to our philosophical moment, which I call metamodernism. Metamodernism is the term that, term that many people are using currently to identify our current philosophical moment because postmodernism, you may not be aware, it, is, it has ended. Of course, it's difficult to name and fully understand our historical moment while we're living in it, but time will tell. Some people are calling our current era post-postmodernism, but I think that sounds rather redundant. Acquiring knowledge in the past meant climbing the ladder toward final mastery. Not anymore. In metamodern culture, we learn new tools and apps constantly while evaluating live information and adapting to new devices and software updates. There's no end to the incoming stream of information. I'll give you a link to my book, which is titled, this is my current book, Metamodernism and Changing Literacy. And this book addresses the challenges that we face due to these changes. It's imperative that we each understand our own personal responsibility as digital citizens. So what is literacy? in digital culture. I've introduced you to a term that fits with this personal responsibility, and this is at any age, from little tiny kids through the elderly. And that term is meta-literacy. I didn't come up with this term. 
Tom Mackey and Trudy Jacobson first coined the term in 2014 to help us better understand how we can be literate in digital culture as prosumers. And this is essential to digital citizenship. You can find more about metaliteracy um, on their website, metaliteracy.org, and you can read a guest blog po post that I shared on that site. You can see on the circle here where I'm sitting, if you zoom in on the circle, you can see that you play many roles as a meta-literate individual, as both a consumer and a producer of content and information in all formats, images, text, music, sound effects. The internet has connected everyone. It's given everyone a voice. Yet, not everyone has something meaningful to add to the conversation. The internet has become a flood of information that is impossible to navigate without metaliteracy. Once we understand what it means to be prosumers and participants in digital culture, well, unless you're a hermit high up in the mountain somewhere with no internet connection at all, we can become aware of the need for digital citizenship. We can learn to be ethical contributors and participants. So do you feel it's important for you to be an ethical digital citizen? I'd like you to type a Y or an N in the local chat. Great, I'm seeing a Y. Yes, to be ethical is very important. Not to add to that flood of information and nonsense. And I'm zooming in on the circle here. Some of the things that you can be as a researcher, a participant, a communicator, translator, author, teacher, collaborate, collaborator, producer, publisher, everyone can be those particular roles in digital culture. I'm going to stand up and move over to this colorful wheel here and sit on my next slide. I mentioned that everyone has a voice online, but not everything shared is good, meaningful, or even true. In fact, Mackey and Jacobson at the metaliteracy.org site, they believe we live in a post-truth world. It's very difficult to dig into the truth. We have to take a questioning stance and we have to understand how to evaluate information for ourselves. Less get gatekeepers now that libraries have changed. The many elements of digital citizenship are, are well beyond the scope of my short talk today. But look at this wheel. All of these topics that I'm sitting upon cover ethical use of information, cybersecurity, safety, online communication, privacy, and even emotional intelligence. Yes, digital citizenship covers numerous concepts in digital culture. This wheel came from the DQ Institute. I'll give you the website here in the local chat. The community virtual library where I work has built a digital citizenship museum virtually in the metaverse, and it's in the virtual world of Kitely. And we have, a li we have library branches in other virtual worlds as well, besides Second Life. You can find out more on our website. Our main branch is right here in Second Life. If you zoom in on the, the color wheel here, you'll see that, that meta-literacy intersects with all of these various concepts. And each one of you standing right here in front of the slide, you have a digital identity right here as an avatar. Digital citizenship has become essential for all of us, as I said, at all ages. I'll move over to my next slide. Meta literacy in meta modern culture requires balance. I mentioned, I think, 
that I was a school librarian for 20 years. And during that time, I witnessed the close of, in quotations here, the Gutenberg parenthesis. That was a certain time period that has closed, about 500 years. Print is no longer king of information, but it was from the time Gutenberg created the press around 1500 to around the year 2000. Print was king. Here's a, here's a link to, that will explain more about the Gutenberg parenthesis if you're interested. That period from about 1500 to 2000, that was when books became accessible to anyone. But now, fixed or print media is giving way to fluid digital media. No more printed encyclopedias or dictionaries, or very few anyway. No need, we can find it all online instantly. But how many of you still enjoy reading a book in print? Type a Y if you do. Great, I'm seeing some Ys. I love print books, of course, as a librarian. And you see, I balance them on top of my avatar head. I believe they'll most likely always be around. They're such a convenient and portable uh, format. They don't run out of power right at the exciting part that you're reading and they don't crash. So I think we'll always have print books, but we will also use ebooks. I recently took a trip and I could carry a lot of books on an e-reader. We'll have websites, databases, videos, podcasts, blogs, and apps, 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 and more. Juggling all these tools sometimes simultaneously, is actually changing the human brain. There's a chapter about that in my recent book. This juggling is a meta-literacy skill, and it's part of digital citizenship. One can easily get sucked away by the stream of social media into a self-absorbed whir whirlpool Look around, you'll see people scroll, scroll, scroll all day long. More on that, on the dark side of digital culture in my book, and there is a dark side. Not only must we learn to juggle and choose the best digital tools, we also juggle between worlds, physical, virtual, or augmented, XR, extended reality. Choosing the best space for a specific purpose, whether working, gaming, social interaction, so social interaction or, or learning, choosing the best tool is a meta-literacy skill. It's a balancing act that is now a personal responsibility. New platforms are emerging constantly with virtual reality headsets and 360 degree videos becoming main, mainstream. Yes, it's a balancing act. Now, do any of you have a VR headset? Just like to see that. Type a Y or an N in the local chat. All right, I see a Y. Uh, both Sidearm, who's filming today, and I have explored many VR headset platforms, as well as what we like to call VR desktop platforms, like Second Life right here. This is VR on a desktop. Personally, I find it more com way more comfortable than a headset. In fact, I feel as immersed here as I do in my headset, but I have many more tools available here at my fingertips. I'll move over to my next slide. Zoom in here on the black side slide, and you'll see, <clears throat> speaking of being immersed in a live virtual environment, just think right now, this is live and we are talking across the, the globe as avatars. And let's consider each one of you as an avatar here is a human being. And you are using a computer, computer tool to create a digital version of yourself. What does it mean to be a live avatar in the metaverse versus a live being in the real world, in the physical world? I would love to have flown on a plane over to Ireland to meet you. I love presenting physically face to face, but here we are 
virtually. Now, having worked here for many years, I feel I'm the same. I'm the same being, whether I'm an avatar or the body with hands that is typing these words on a computer. You can see I put my avatar face and my physical world face, and I'm comfortable. I'm the same with both. Although in the metaverse, there are many other ways to utilize an avatar. My young grandson and I are learning, learning together in Minecraft with a blocky avatar. I'm not quite as bonded with that one. Think about how you feel as an avatar. Think about that because we may talk about that again when we debrief. Think about the difference between being together in a virtual digital space or together in the physical world. What is it that makes it real? I'll move over here and talk for just a minute about our philosophical moment. So, I think we have become meta-modern, and it's certainly time to become meta-literate. Meta-modernism, this slide shows how, it, how it's art and much more, our, our philosophical moment. We express ourselves in our cultural era, in the time period in which we live through art, literature, music, and architecture, while postmodernism is sort of represented through remembering how we tore down the grand narratives of history. And this brought a plethora of dystopian fiction to my library, a lot of zombies. <laughs> and it, uh, metamodern, metamodernism is different in that it's ushering in a new age that balances irony and sincerity, an age which balances a respect for tradition alongside the excitement of innovation. And in my book about metamodernism, I take a look at our philosophical eras of the past, stressing the importance of learning through the history of the past. Of course, it's impossible for us to fully understand, or as I said earlier, to name a historical era when you're living in it in the present. So metamodernism is not a fully adopted term yet, but many are starting to use it. Another term that is in the running is hypermodernism. Yes, the information revolution has changed literacy forever, and we now live in a very fascinating and fast-paced time period, no matter what it's called. But I've adopted this term metamodernism in discussion of our current philosophical area, era, um, although I said, you know, post-postmodernism is another term for it. And I'm presenting this topic today here in the metaverse, which I know you've heard that term. It's become quite a popular buzzword, the metaverse. And we're, I'm presenting it in a place where metadata constructs a simulation of reality. Now think about that. We're here inside a metaphor of our world. So as you're thinking about that, you, you're thinking about your thinking, that's metacognition. So I'm using this prefix meta, meta, meta. It gets a, a lot of meta going on here. And our library here in Second Life supports, as I mentioned, the Virtual Worlds Education Consortium. Um, we're rebranding our overall website name, and it'll soon be called metaverselibraries.org. And it's, that's still under development, but it shows the importance of understanding digital citizenship and meta-literacy in the metaverse. And now you might be thinking that's why Facebook changed their name to Meta. <laughs> There's a lot of Meta. But we won't go into that since we don't want one company to own the metaverse, and certainly it will never. You're learning today in a virtual environment, which is a meta-literacy skill. And the slide I'm sitting on now, I like this slide, because if you zoom into the top left, you'll see how learning environments have changed. Traditional rows of desks in that old black and white picture, they have evolved into virtual spaces and augmented reality apps as we merge into multiple realities. 
On the slide where I sit, you'll see um, a world where it says educators in VR. On my VR headset, I went there, met some educators. Um, it was called Altspace VR, and they recently closed. So many of these environments, as I say, are evolving, emerging. Some close and give way to others. Yes, it's a changing information landscape. And I mentioned that Sidearm and I often visit different educational environments with or without VR headsets. We've explored augmented reality apps, which are also a meta-literacy skill. And recently, you're mo all of you have probably heard about this, artificial intelligence has exploded into our lives with OpenAI and ChatGPT. This is certainly going to impact literacy and our future. We'll probably talk about that later in our debrief. Let's move over to this next slide where it says preservation of literacy formats. An important part of our digital metamodern culture and metaliteracy is preservation the preservation of literacy formats. And that means, how are you going to find it in the future? You've probably stumbled on this, where you lost something, or you used to have it in a format, and now you can't read that format anymore. Look at some of the formats I'm sitting on. An old cassette tape that fell apart. How many of you ever had a cassette tape? Some of you are probably too young to listen to music on those. And the VHS tapes here where we watched our videos and movies, these are becoming obsolete. Now, I'm not going to go deeply into this as we don't have a lot of time for this. I could do a whole present presentation on preservation of literacy formats and how important this is, how essential this is to the future of civilization. Preservation, too, is a personal meta-literacy skill. You have personal photos, and maybe you're saving them in the cloud or on flash drives or in digital, or maybe you're printing out photo albums. We still like our print media materials, but most content today, as I mentioned, is born digital, and we must learn how to migrate to new formats, or it could all be lost. In fact, the archivist of the United States, David Ferriero, Ferriero, he says this keeps him up at night. If we don't figure out how to migrate all this digital content as the machines that we read it on are also becoming obsolete. Do you have any concerns about archiving your photos and the content that you create, videos, um, essays, the work, the work you do as students, your blogs? Archiving those in the future? Are most of your photos digital or do you have any physical photo albums? Digital archival will be a problem in the future for all of us, individually and as a culture. You see the Dead Scrolls, um, the Dead Sea Scrolls right there on this image that I'm sitting on? Those were physical. And after thousands of years, they could put together what, what it was saying you can't do that when you've lost digital media. What will happen to our digital assets when we pass away? A whole industry is arising in the field of digital legacy. When someone dies, what happens to all of their content when it's behind firewalls and password protected? We're beginning to think that this is a problem that we all have to address. So, something to contemplate, and I'll move over to my next slide. I've gone through all of this fairly quickly to present some of the concepts that literacy brings up in digital culture and how they change the way we read and write and how we are no longer simply consumers of information, but prosumers both producing and consuming information. And so there are two terms that you can take away today. Metamodernism, 
which simply means our cultural moment, the time period in which we're living. You can look that up later and you can see some of the um, research that's coming out on our changing philosophical era, which is fascinating. And the other term that you can walk away with today is meta-literacy. Meta-literacy is simply a term to address literacy as prosumers. And from the meta-literacy site, here's how they explain it. Meta-literacy promotes critical thinking and collaboration in a digital age, providing a comprehensive framework to effectively participate in social media and online communities. It is a unified construct that supports the acquisition, production, and sharing of knowledge in collaborative online communities. And that's certainly where we are right now. We're standing right here. We're a collaborative community. The Community Virtual Library is an open library for online communities. We live and learn now more in online communities than we do in physical world communities, although we still value them greatly. You'll see I have a few references here. I'll sit on my references slide. I did mention that Mackie and Jacobson are the ones who coined the term meta-literacy. And you'll see some meta-modernism authors here, Van, Van Deniker, Gibbons, and Vermeulen, um, who uh, Robin, Van De Robin Van Deniker um, wrote the foreword to my book. So he's, he knows a lot about, it, came up with a lot of research on meta-modernism. Now, I hope that you're going to ponder your own responsibility today for digital citizenship. And I hope you'll think, uh, critically think, about your own changing literacy and all of the apps that you use and all of the tools that you use when you are communicating. The pandemic, it forced so many people to adopt new tools, digital tools, and it was not easy for, for some people who were not comfortable with using digital and, and virtual environments. You might be comfortable utilizing many do, digital tools and applications, but even if you're very comfortable, it is impossible to use them all. There are millions of apps, many, many tools for educators to choose to teach um, virtually online, content management platforms, it is very difficult to keep up with the incredible volume of apps and information online. It can be overwhelming. Too much information is as problematic as too little. In fact, we are drowning in information and we need to learn how to navigate through it. Remember I mentioned the dark side of digital culture? Well, I'm about to show it to you. I'd like you to follow me back down the ramp so that we can contemplate the darkness and some of the problems that we face. You may feel a little cramped in here. You may feel a little uncomfortable. That's intentional. That's what happens in digital culture. It's not very comfortable. You can't always easily find your way. The internet and digital culture with our many online applications Contains, contains a dark side. So I wanted to make a dark setting for you to think about some of the dark problems that we face. If you zoom in on the slide next to me where I'm sitting on another stool, notice personal dashboards and confirmation bias, resource evaluation, which is very difficult, and other concepts, concepts that are difficult for us. You can turn your environment to midnight if you'd like to enhance this dark room, make it even darker. To do that in the Second Life Viewer, you just choose World, Environment, and Midnight. So you see on the sign above me, the dark side of digital culture, each of us has created a personal dashboard on our digital devices. Whether you're on a smartphone, a computer, a tablet, an iPad, 
Chromebook, whatever device it is, and whatever whatever um, computer device you're on in Second Life right now, none of them look the same. You all have different dashboards. You all have different tools that you go to, different places to listen to your music, different places that you follow people and scroll through your incoming information and even the news. You all have personalized your incoming information, which has its pros and cons. We choose our incoming information. That means we're creating our own information landscapes. And also, if you zoom in on the next slide near me, you'll see too much information. As I said, we're drowning in it. We have millions of choices every day. Now, when I was growing up, we did not have millions of choices of information. We had a limited choice. We could actually have someone help us find the best of the best. Too much information is just as problematic as too little information. Back when we had very little access, back before books, before print, people had very little access to information. Some people predict that if we don't figure out how to, how to conquer too much information, we could enter the digital dark ages. <laughs> that sounds so sci-fi, but it is a problem. Too much information. I'm going to stand and move over here by FOMO. And you can zoom in on the slide where I'm sitting. FOMO. Have any of you ever experienced FOMO? Do you think you know what it is? Type a Y if you, if you know what FOMO is. You've heard of it. Or you've experienced it. Either, either one. FOMO. The fear. Type what it is if you know what it means. <laughs> FOMO stands for F-O-M-O. -O. If you know what it, me what it means, feel free to type it. And it's this sort of a, a little bit of an anxious feeling and anxiety, this feeling that you're, you're missing out. Something exciting or interesting is happening. Exactly, Sharon, fear of missing out. So you reach for your device. Many teens sleep right next to their, their device because they have FOMO. Something's happening. The second you wake up, or even if you wake up in the middle of the night, some teens reach over and scroll because... Something's going on out there and they have FOMO. It's a huge problem uh, for many teenagers that they're so attached to their phone. It's like right next to them. And it, it, it's, uh, it's interesting how quickly that happened in digital culture. And another huge problem to, um, if you keep going to the right, we're turning here at clockwise, confirmation bias. See the Venn diagram? It's a problem that we all face, even if, we're, even if we're really good at trying to evaluate information online. We tend to follow people who think like we do. Social media apps lure us into following people that we agree with. But that's not how we learn. We do not learn by talking with people who think exactly like we do and who agree with our ideas. Vygotsky said, and he's a famous Russian developmental psychologist, he says that we learn in collision with other ideas, in collision with other people, not by following what they think. We want to think critically for ourselves. We learn through debate and discussion of new ideas and perspectives. And what about privacy? I used to kind of joke that privacy died in 2008 because that's when I really began to see a lot of changes in my um, teaching and my library. Is privacy dead now? that data companies can mine all of our data and control the information that we receive. Sometimes I also joke that Google knows more about me than I know about myself. And now that artificial intelligence is, is just coming out with so many new apps and tools, it feels kind of like Big Brother is watching. We have, have tremendous obstacles to overcome in digital culture. And many of these obstacles relate to metaliteracy. 
privacy, cybersecurity, and conf confirmation bias, which is that tendency to follow and interact only with those that we agree with. Now, some of you may have uh, faced this problem when confirmation uh, raises it, its head, when confirmation bias really, really overtakes um, our social media uh, tools. You may see, you may have heard some families who have become, had arguments over their um, political uh, beliefs, or you've had people who don't follow anybody because they don't think like they do and they ban their friends. You, you see a lot of arguments on social media and much of that stems, stems from confirmation bias. So I'll move over here to my cyborg slide. There's a lot of problems in digital culture, but I remain hopeful that these obstacles really could be seen as oppor opportunities if we're truly aware of them. So type in the chat if, as we're sitting here in this digital dark, dark room, you have some concerns about privacy or about cybersecurity. If, if you're concerned about it, type a Y. We can't all be experts on cybersecurity. Great, I'm seeing some whys. And I think we should all be concerned. Here in Second Life at the Community Virtual Library and the VWEC, which is the Virtual Worlds Education Consortium, we have some experts in the field who can help us when we have questions. Because together we can learn how to be cyber safe, how to, how to protect our own privacy, Sometimes the terms of service on the applications we, we use and we, um, we download on our devices, they have page after page of legal, legal terms that are written. Only a lawyer could understand it. And we just say, yes, I'm going to use this app because all of the people that I work with are, is, are using it. That's digital culture and it is a concern. So how can we get out of this dark place where we're all sitting? How can we conquer the dark side of digital culture? Well, only by becoming good digital citizens. So we're gonna to head to the library to discuss this. I like how I, this cyborg here is asking, how can we keep our humanity in the metaverse? It's important that we understand that we are people. We are each a human being. We don't wanna lose our humanity.